Yes, we come now to the eighth study presentation of the British Columbian Camp 1984. This is the 11 o'clock study period on Sunday, which is the 25th, is it? 26th. <clears throat> now we'll continue the study of the Laodicean message and its historical applications. And this um, study, of course, is tied to a number of other prophecies. Now, some of you folk will have heard the next two or three studies before, but many of you will not have. And I and I think it's quite important that we do put um, these prophecies together with the Laodicean message to, to show their very, very close relationship. I'm quite sure, too, those who have heard these presentations previously will gain more from them today, more insights and so on. And... Um, the next few presentations will cover the different prophecies that point to the development of the Laodicean message and indicate that the, the, the place where the Seventh-day Adventist Church now stands and will show our emergence into history and will demonstrate very clearly, of course, that history is being made at the present time. I'll give you a list of the studies we'll be taking up. The first one will be called The Two Days of Opportunity from Daniel chapters 8 and 9. The second one, the marriage power from Matthew 22. The third one, the chapter from uh, the study from Matthew 25 called the Ten Virgins. The next one will be called the shaking from early writings. And uh, along that general line, we'll see where we go from that point. Now, at the present moment of time, the lay of the sin message is being preached. I think we're satisfied on that point. We recognise that the latest sin message is the 1888 message. We preach that. It is the everlasting gospel. We preach that, which is the same thing, of course. It's the third angel message, and we preach that too. I we, we saw last night how we're today in was it the fifth effort on God's part to bring the church to um, to find the uh, final preparation for the final work. And that if this effort on God's part fails, he'll have to try another people, another time, another place to do what we might have done. I'm encouraged to see that so far in our history we have avoided the, the mistakes which have been the ruin of other movements and the light is still coming through and the work is still advancing so we can have reasonable assurance that we're still on the right track. But let's be very watchful, let's never get complacent and careless because that's a fatal mistake. How many times in past history powerful forces have been defeated because they became negligent and careless in the defence of their fortresses? Now, if then at the present time we are the people whom the latter sin message is developing and as such, of course, are a separated movement from all other church organisations and it's no secret, of course, that we are, then the fact remains that either God is building this movement or God is not building this movement and everyone would agree to that. It's one way or the other. You can't have, have it in between. Either God is building this movement or it is the work of the, of the devil. Now, there are a number of tests, of course, to determine whether this movement is of God or not, but one of them is a sure word of prophecy. Let's turn to Amos 3 and verse 7. To a scripture which, of course, is well known to every seventh day Adventist mind. Amos 3 and verse 7. For the Lord says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing except he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. God will do nothing except he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. Now that means then that um, if God is doing something in the building of this movement, it has been revealed already unto his servants, the prophets. God is never caught by surprise and he announces what he's doing through his servants, the prophets. Therefore, if the movement to which we belong is of God, if this is the work of God, it must be written in the prophecies. Now, I'm not talking today about um, the collection of an odd text here or a statement over there which you can kind of manipulate into a framework of uh, seeming truth to support the, 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 the movement. I'm talking about outline prophecy which have unmistakable starting points followed by a sequence of uh, unmistakable guideposts along the way and plainly revealing a, at a specific and a, again readily recognisable point the emergence of the new movements. 
nor are we content to present only one such outline we need to have at least two and preferably three because the Bible says in Matthew chapter 18 in the mouth of two or three witnesses, witnesses of every truth be established in the ancient Jewish courts of law there had to be at least two actual eyewitnesses of the crime before a person could be convicted of the crime circumstantial evidence was not even considered back in those courts of law set up by the Lord himself now I'm happy to tell you that we don't have one or two such outlines we have at least seven of them and this movement has the strongest prophetic vindication of any movement in past history now you recognize of course that every movement God has called was prophesied somewhere along the line the emergence of Israel from Egypt for instance was prophesied back in Abraham's day and God told Abraham that 400 years would pass or 430 years from a certain point and Israel would come out on the self same day Israel departed the land of Egypt the restoration of Israel was foretold by Jeremiah after 70 years they'd be set free the emergence of the work of John the Baptist was foretold in the book of Isaiah as he who was making straight the way of the Lord the emergence of Christ's mission was also foretold and when the apostles went forth preaching the time is fulfilled Mark chapter 1 verse 15 then they did this on the basis of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 the apostolic church likewise arose on time as did the great reformation churches and the seventh day Adventist church in 1844 arose in response to prophecy so therefore if today we have any right to claim existence it must be written in the prophetic uh, predictions found in both the bible and in the spirit of prophecy now as I said before we offer you seven of these we mightn't cover every one during this camp but we'll cover most of them and I want now to present the first of them which I call the two days of opportunity taken from Daniel's chapter 8 and 9 and which, which presentation is a basis for all the others which will come afterwards now we should be familiar with Daniel chapter 8 I hope we are if we're not we'll spend just a few moments reviewing the contents of this important chapter one of the most important chapters in all the Bible and uh, it begins by uh, it begins in the in the presentation of a vision in which Daniel saw a ram and a he goat and the he goat had, an, had one great horn between his eyes which was broken and this horn then spread it into four horns to the, toward the north the south east and the west and then, then out of one of them came forth a little horn which was exceeding great toward the um, against the against the people of God now those facts I've covered very briefly because you should know them off by heart make the books the, the chapters of Daniel should be should be virtually memorized by every one of us so we know what each chapter contains and what each prophecy is teaching now finally comes this all important question verse 13 then I heard one saint speaking and another saint said unto that certain saint which spoke how long shall be the vision concerning the daily I shan't read the word sacrifice because it's a supplied word and it's not in the original uh, Hebrew text it's put in there and is written in italics in most of your Bibles because the translators felt that the word daily required the word sacrifice even though the word was not in the original text now it doesn't require the word sacrifice in the anatypical situation and so we won't read it how long shall be the vision concerning the daily and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trod underfoot and the answer unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed now Gabriel was told to make this man to understand the vision Daniel 8 and verse 16 let's read verse 15 first and it came to pass when I even I Daniel had seen the vision and sought for the meaning then behold there stood before me as, as the appearance of a man and I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli which called and said Gabriel make this man to understand the vision now it's so important to understand this I'm going to ask you some questions and please answer me back when Gabriel was told to make this man to understand the vision how much of it was Gabriel commissioned to explain all of it right that's very important all of it and if Gabriel should not succeed in doing this in one sitting what must he do have another sitting right 
Now let's see how the prophecy, the vision, which was completed by verse 14, because in 15, Daniel says, I had seen the vision, which in the case, of course, he had seen the entire vision, and he had. Now in verse um, 20 of Daniel chapter 8, it plainly says, The ram which thou sawest having two horns of the kings of Media and Persia. Could you ask for plainer interpretation? Impossible. Verse 21. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And the first king was Alexander the Great. That explains the he goat found back in verses 5 to verse 8. Passing on to verse 22. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And we know, of course, that the Alexandrian Empire broke up into four divisions of Egypt in the south, uh, what is now Turkey in the north, Persia in the east, and Greece in the west. And they were commanded by four generals. You don't have to remember their names, of course, but they were Lysimachus, Cassander, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. Strange Old Testament names. Now, verse 23 begins to explain the little horn power. As a king of fierce countenance, and understanding dark sentences who shall stand up in verse 23. Verses 24 and 25 continue to, to describe this fierce king, which is the little horn power, and that completes the explanation of every part excepting for verses 13 and 14, which, which contain the time element in the prophecy. And the angel begins to explain the time period and stops, as we shall read, verse 26. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. After I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Now this plainly says then that the, that, that the angel began to explain the time aspect of the prophecy. He done all the rest, but this part was left unexplained. And then suddenly he cuts off or stops his explanation. And next thing we read that Daniel faints away because he can't endure the fearful sight that has been presented to him in the prophecy, which we'll look at in just a moment. That means that a certain portion of this prophecy was left unexplained, but Gabriel's responsibility had, was therefore not fully discharged. And later he must complete the explanation. Now I must admit that there are many years in which I was kind of sorry that Daniel was not able to bear the full revelation and did faint away because I encountered people out there in the world of the Baptists and Brethren churches in particular who claimed that there was no connection between Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9 and I found it very difficult to argue with them on this point. I kept saying to myself how much easier it would be if uh, the explanation had been completed back in Daniel chapter 8 then there'd be no question about the fact that the 2,200 days were uh, part of the Daniel uh, 9 revelation, which became the Daniel 9 revelation. But the time came when I rejoiced at the wisdom of God in not giving Daniel special strength at this time to receive the entire vision. I was very glad that uh, Daniel 9 was separated from Daniel 8 because by so doing we have the answer to two very important questions given at the same point of time. So let's now look at the connection between Daniel chapter 8 and 9 to see how this connection is there. <clears throat> now Daniel uh, chapter 8, the vision was given in the closing year of the reign of Belshazzar king of Babylon. So let's start now to build our diagram of this particular prophecy which we call the two days of opportunity. So this line represents the passing of time and here we have the period of uh, captivity in Babylon which lasted for just about 68 years between the years 606 BC and 538 BC when Babylon fell and, and there was a period of 68 years. The 70 years extend down to 536 when the Israelites were given their freedom and sent back again to their own country. Now Daniel, <clears throat> Daniel was captive in the land of Babylon throughout the entire 70 year period. He was taken captive very early in the... Uh, about 
taken captive very early in the uh, period of Nebuchadnezzar's campaigns against Israel. Nebuchadnezzar came, I think, three times against the Israelites before the captivity was complete and Jerusalem finally destroyed. So Daniel was there throughout the entire period. Now the vision of Daniel chapter 8 was given just before the fall of Babylon in the last year of the reign of Belshazzar, king of Babylon. Daniel chapter 8 was given at that point. Daniel chapter 9 was given in the first year of the reign of Darius of the Medes and Persians. So here we have Daniel chapter 9 and recognizing this relationship is quite important. So Daniel chapter 9 then introduced a new, a new situation. And let's see now what took place in Daniel 9 when Daniel was concerned about the ongoing captivity of the children of Israel. Let's read 9, verse 1 to start with. Well, let's read verse 1 and 2. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by, the, by books the number of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish seventy years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, why should Daniel be so concerned about this question at this point of time? And, and the answer, I think, is quite obvious. Daniel had expected, on the basis of Jeremiah's prophecy, that when the 70 years ended, which they hadn't quite, I guess he had difficulty knowing just when to start them, and he figured that the fall of Babylon would come from the end of the 70 years, it was just a little short of that time, and Daniel expected that when Babylon fell, Israel would be restored to their own land again. But, Daniel also understood that the conditional nature of God's prophecies, and therefore he feared that uh, the prophecy had become null and void because Israel had not fulfilled the conditions. Let's talk about this for just a moment. The Lord says in Jeremiah chapter 18, let's go back to that chapter and read the text together, Jeremiah chapter 18, that there is a, con that there is a conditional clause attached to every prophecy God makes in regard to the building up or tearing down of a particular nation. We start with uh, verse 7 of Jeremiah chapter 18. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a king kingdom to pluck up and to pull down to destroy it? If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil which I have thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it? If it do evil in my sight, and obey not my voice, then I'll repent of the good whereas I said I would benefit them. So, when God spoke you know, words of judgment against a particular nation, and that nation repented of, of its sins, then God likewise held back or removed the threat which was, which was um, overshadowing it. On the other hand, when a nation was spoken of well, and they turned from righteousness to sin, then the things God promised to do would not be done either. So there's this conditional clause to every prophecy made in regard to churches and nations. Now some examples of this of course are given in the Word of God. Take for instance the occasion when Nineveh heard the preaching of, Noah, of Jonah, not Noah, Jonah. And Jonah came there and simply said to the people of that city, in 40 days this place should be destroyed. You don't read about Jonah saying, unless you repent. And the king of Nineveh said to his people, Now maybe God may turn aside this judgment if we, if we do repent. And so they repented. Then Jonah went up on the hillside to watch the destruction of Nineveh because he didn't understand the principle apparently of conditional prophecies. And when Nineveh was not destroyed because the conditions had been met to save it, Jonah was very upset because he said, Lord, you make me to be a false prophet, remember? And he was most upset about that. So there's one instance where God made a very clear declaration that I will destroy this place in 40 days, therefore repent. And when they did repent, he didn't destroy it, or didn't permit its destruction, to be more accurate. Another instance is when Israel left the land of Egypt and God said to them that they would occupy the land of Egypt and enjoy its fruits and treasures. When they came to Kadesh Barnea and uh, rebelled against God's leadership and position, and threatened to um, stone to death the divinely appointed leaders of Moses, Aaron, Joshua and Caleb, for instance. 
then God came down and said to them that they would know his breach of promise. Let's turn to Numbers chapter 14 and um, we find that uh, God made the statement very clearly and plainly in Numbers chapter 14 that he would uh, take away from them the, the promise which he had made to them. Right, Numbers chapter 14. Um, just lost the text for the moment. Um, right, the, the, the passage starts in Numbers 14 verse 26 and goes over quite a few verses. But let's just pick up the thought in uh, verse 13 where it says, after saying that they would die in the wilderness, Doubtless you shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell therein, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh and Joshua the son of Nun. But your little ones whom you, shall, whom you said should be a prey, them will I bring in, and, and they shall know the land which you have despised. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children shall wander in the wilderness forty years, and bear your whoredoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness." After the number of the days in which you search the land, even forty days, each day for a year, shall you bear your iniquities, even forty years, and you shall know my breach of promise. In other words, God specifically told those folk before they left the land of Egypt that they would personally enter the land of Canaan. But that was conditional upon them doing their parts. And the prophecy was not uh, unconditional by any means whatsoever. And when they failed to do their part, then what? They were not permitted to go in. Instead, they all died in the desert. And God said, you will know my breach of promise. Now, a prophecy which causes many folk a great deal of difficulty is one made in Volume 1, The Testimonies. You remember, no doubt, um, where it talks about, the, about some folk at the camp meeting being food for worms, some being subject to the seven last plagues, and some being alive upon the earth when Jesus returned. And of course that's a long time ago now, an awful long time ago. And um, page 132 in volume 1, I'll, I'll read the actual statement for you. And uh, unless we recognise the conditional nature of these prophecies, of course, we'll find that we'll never have any hope of understanding this particular statement. Going back to page 131 to 132, volume 1 of the Testimonies, I read these words. I was shown the company person at the conference, said the angel, some food for worms, some subjects of the seven last plagues, some will be alive and remain upon the earth to be translated at the coming of Jesus. Now this was written way back in, let me see if I can find a date, that is about 1857 I believe. It's 1856 actually. It's testimony number two in 1856. And that is 132 years ago, right? Is that great? No, uh, no, it isn't either. It's 126 years, 128 years ago. I'm not sure that's great yet. <laughs> I'll do it in the paper. 1984, less 1856. It's uh, 138, 128 years ago. 128 years ago, and we perfectly well know, of course, that. Um, all the folk of that conference had long since died, long since died, and therefore this prophecy was never fulfilled. Some, none of those who were alive at that time will remain upon the earth to see Jesus come in the clouds of heaven, but they would have if the people of God had fulfilled the conditions and responded to the latter sin message given to them at, at that point of time. And that was a conditional prophecy, just like Jonah's prophecy or the prophecy given through Moses to Israel in Egypt, and many more we could we could quote, of course, take Hezekiah who pled for 15 and got 15 more years of life and got Tony totally die from that particular disease. So this conditional this conditional element is present in all these great prophecies. Now, Daniel understood that principle, and when he saw the close of Babylon's reign, the breaking of Babylon's power, but the people of God not yet set free, then what was the big concern upon his mind? Have they? frustrated God's prophecy by their own negligence and failure to measure up to the conditions involved. That was a big question on Daniel's mind. Now to make that question even more troublesome, remember back in Daniel chapter 8 he'd been given a view of future events. 
He saw the rise of Medo-Persia, followed by the rise of Grecia, followed by the rise of Rome, and away there in the distant future he saw another period of time which, which paralleled the period in which he himself lived to 1260 years from 538 to 1798 during which time there would be a repetition of the conditions which existed in his day. Now, what were the three particular conditions existent during the time of Babylon's supremacy, during those 70 years? And the answer is, one, the sanctuary was cast down, two, the daily was taken away, and three, the people of God were trodden underfoot. Now, in Daniel's time, of course, the sanctuary was literally cast down, it was a heap of rubble. No stone was left upon another, just torn to pieces. But during the 1260 years, in what sense was the sanctuary then cast down? In what sense, or in what way? It was cast down by the fact that the ruling church of that time taught the people that every Roman Catholic church was the true and only antitype of the Old Testament sanctuary. And that down on this earth, and not up in heaven, the sanctuary is to be found. So the place of the sanctuary was cast down during that period. How was the daily removed, the daily intercession of Jesus Christ? By putting in the place of Jesus Christ the intercessory work of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who was supposed to be in heaven, and of course of the priests and um, bishops and archbishops down here upon this earth. And so the service of the Mass took the place of the daily service or the daily ministration of Christ in the sanctuary above. And it's not hard to recognise, of course, in both periods, the people of God were trampled underfoot by the persecuting power of the awesome might of Babylon. Now when Daniel then saw all this future history back in Daniel chapter 8, and when he saw the people of God not released at this point of time, would that not, not cause him intense anxieties as far as the future of his church was concerned? And it did. In fact, it <clears throat> back in Daniel chapter 8, the awful, awful spectacle the dreadful presentation caused him to faint away he didn't have the physical strength to bear the, uh, the uh, sorrow and disappointment that this revelation brought to him the same as yesterday we read about Sister White becoming desperately ill almost to the point of death because of the failure of God's faith to respond to the warning given in the Laodicean message so then Daniel 9 is, is the record of Daniel's prayer in consequence of his anxiety over the development of events around him at that point of time. If, for instance, with the fall of Babylon, Cyrus and Darius had immediately released the Israelites and said, now you go back to your own country and build your temple again, your city again, Daniel would not have been so concerned. He'd been quite happy with that development. Now then, in verse 2 of Daniel chapter 9 it says, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the, de in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek, to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Now I shan't take time today to read the prayer of Daniel which you've read before. But if you were to sum up this prayer, what was it? Acceptable. It was an acceptable confession. Now, he was confessing sin. But Daniel was a man against whom not one single sin is recorded, right? I'm not saying he didn't sin, but no sin is recorded against Daniel. He's a man who lived a, a life above reproach and despite the pressure brought to bear upon him by the king of Babylon first and later by the king of Medo-Persia or the, or the princes of Medo-Persia, Daniel never faltered nor turned aside in the least degree from his appointed duty. So really if every Israelite had been as Daniel was there certainly would have been no captivity none whatsoever so therefore what real need was there to confess his own sins none or very little if any but on the other hand of course the Israelites had been a very sinful people and because of their sinfulness they had brought upon themselves this dreadful weight of woe now Daniel so identified himself with his people that he confessed their sins as if they were his sins didn't they? Right? He confessed theirs as if, as if they were his own. And in this great confession of sin, he's asking God to pardon our sins so God's purpose can be fulfilled. And so the prayer goes on along those lines. It um, is one of those prayers, other than the Old Testament by Daniel and another one by Hezekiah and another one by Ezra and, Je Ezra and Nehemiah, 
which fulfilled the conditions laid down next in Leviticus 26 and verse 40 where God said if you will confess your sins and the sins of your fathers then I'll bless you and left me amazed at the general conference back in 1950 or June the 50s anyway when they answered Will and Short and made the point or tried to make the point that God does not require us to confess the sins of our fathers no place in scripture is to be found and yet we have the plain statement in Leviticus 26 verse 40 and the example is given by Hezekiah, Ezra, Nehemiah and here by Daniel now come to verse 20 when Daniel concludes his prayer or perhaps is still praying because it says and while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God yea while I was speaking in prayer even the man Gabriel whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning of beginning being caused to fly swiftly touched me about the time of the evening oblation and he informed me and talked with me and said O Daniel I am now come forth to give you skill and understanding at the beginning of your supplication the commandment came forth and I have come to show you for you are greatly beloved therefore understand the matter and consider the vision two things let's not miss that point under any circumstances the angel said understand the matter now what matter the matter upon his mind upon Daniel's mind and what was the matter upon Daniel's mind the future of his own people right were they going to remain in Babylon or would meet the Persia as captives or would they go back and rebuild the city and the temple would they do their appointed work now Daniel apparently seems to have largely forgotten the vision for the moment he didn't understand the time element in it but he'd forgotten it for the moment and he's thinking only of the 70 years prophecy of Jeremiah and of the future of his people but the angel said while you understand the matter also consider the vision which means now that two questions are going to be answered by one answer question number one the 2,200 days question number two the future of Israel and the one answer given in Daniel 9 24 to 27 is going to cover both those questions and they do and this is why I'm so thankful today that God did delay the the answer to Daniel the final explanation to Daniel until such time as God could answer both questions with one reply and tie the whole thing together very beautifully as you'll see develop in the next few minutes now <clears throat> verse 24 says 70 weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city to finish the transgression to make an end of sins and to, bring, and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the prince will be seven weeks and three score and two weeks the streets will be built again and the wall even in troublous times now I'm going to assume and I hope quite correctly of course that you folk don't need me to prove the 457 BC date that's something you should know already and can learn of course from Adventist publications already in existence and especially from the spirit of prophecy now 70 weeks were determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city in other words the word determined means to have been appointed set aside cut off um, delegated so 70 weeks of probationary time remain for the Israelites in which to accomplish some very remarkable things number one to finish the transgression number two to make an end of sins number three to make reconciliation for iniquity number four to bring in everlasting righteousness number five to seal up the vision and prophecy and number six to anoint the most holy all that inside the 490 year period now we know that the 490 year period began in the year 457 BC and was to run over to the year 34 AD All right, so this is BC 457 and this then is the 490 year period now, I'm not so particularly concerned today about um, proving the starting point or the finishing point because that should be well known to us already I am concerned more with showing the relationship of this to the questions that were on the, on the mind of Daniel and the answers given by the angel at the same time but let's pass on to uh, verse 26 Daniel chapter 9 
And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself, and the people of the prince who shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolation that determined. So in the 483 years that reach also from 457 BC bring us down to the beginning of Christ's ministry in the midst of which we find the cross was erected and Christ was crucified three and a half years after his ministry began and three and a half years before the end of the 490 year period. Now it doesn't say, it, uh, the prophecy does not require that the people of the prince who shall come, which of course was the Romans under Cestius and then later Titus, were to destroy the city in the sanctuary. That was to take place beyond and, and did take place of course in AD 70. Now verse 27, And he, that is Jesus Christ the Messiah, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspring of abomination he shall make it desolate even unto the consummation. And that determines to be put upon the desolate or the desolator. And this text is, is, is well worth noticing as we pass because today there's quite a large number of theologians who claim that uh, the Jews are again to be restored to universal favour, to be, to be again God's people. And as God's people they are to... Um, be the instruments to carry the gospel to, to the world and Jerusalem is once again going to be a holy city but this text tells us otherwise it says and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate and the it refers back to the city and to the people even until the consummation and the consummation is at the end of the thousand years when all things will be finally wrapped up and the Review and Herald of July 30, 1901, Review and Herald of July 30, 1901, Sister White there says that Jerusalem shall never again be a holy place until Christ descends upon the Mount of Olives and purifies the site to, so the new Jerusalem can take the place of the old Jerusalem. Not until then will the site become a holy place again. So right down to the end of time, beyond that, through the thousand years, Jerusalem remains a place that is co a place for the overspring of abominations the abomination of course which makes desolate and that point is well worth remembering now then <clears throat> let's now begin to extend our parallel as you said of course a moment ago that um, in 457 BC began the final period of probationary time for the Jewish nation a time in which they were to finish the transgression to make an end of sins in other words, God purposed to finish his work during that 490 year period. He purposed to do that. And A.T. Jones makes the point in Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection that an end of sins can be made only when two things are achieved. Number one, when the image of Christ shall be so perfectly reproduced in his people that sin within them will have ended forever. And B, or two, when the wicked having been destroyed by their own sins no longer exist, then sin, of course, ends in that fashion as well. Now, we ask ourselves the question today, has sin yet been ended? We must reply, no. The world is steeped in it still, and every hand men are, men are, men are loaded with sin and iniquity, wherever you can see. So certainly if sin has not yet been ended, and everlasting righteousness not yet brought in, it certainly was not accomplished in that 490 year period. Obviously not. So... That, that first day of opportunity failed, failed miserably. Remember, God did not say it would be done in the 490 years. He simply said it is given to you in which time to do it. But whether it was done or not depended upon whether they were faithful to their commission and did God's work in God's own way. Whereas, of course, we do have the assurance that in regard to the second day of opportunity that, that under 2,300 days and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. It's not, no, there's no doubt about it anymore there's no might be but it's a very very positive and complete statement now we'll demonstrate this afternoon and I'll just run ahead of myself a little bit my time has virtually gone for the study period that uh, in 1844 this will become very clear this afternoon the Adventist church stood at exactly the same point as the Jews stood back in 457 BC one difference being, of course, that we're given an undisclosed period of probationary time for the Adventist Church, 
whereas for the Jews there was a disclosed period of probationary time, namely 490 years. And we'll recognise then that the 2,300 days simply joins the same point of time, in other words it goes full circle. It, it runs right across here and comes back and joins 1844 to 457 BC. And when we look this afternoon at the parallel period between 538 or 536 and 457, and what took place there is parallel to what took place between 798 and 1844, we'll find that the church did in fact come back full circle to the same point in 44 that the church was back in 457 BC. And we'll see how the events which took place during this period from 457 to 34 AD have been repeated with uncanny accuracy during the period of Adventist church history as well. And what God is doing at the present time is but a replay of what God did to meet the same situation back in the days of the Jews. And thus this presentation becomes an extremely valuable basis on which to look at the subsequent presentation of Matthew 22, Matthew 25, the seven angels, and so forth. Now we'll leave it at that point for now because that comes to a natural stopping point for the moment. And we'll pick this thing up again when we come back to meet together at 3 o'clock this afternoon.